Hello, everybody. I'm Cody. And I'm Brent. And we are the Hugo Nuts, here to review and discuss with you the best sci fi novels and sometimes short stories of all time. Um, and I say short stories because this week we are chatting with author Ken Liu. Make sure you like, subscribe, download, follow, however you listen to us, um, so you don't miss the next episode on Blind Sight by Peter Watts, which is going to be a really fun one. Uh, but today, right now, we have an interview with Ken Liu, who has written a lot of science fiction and speculative fiction short stories. Uh, two collections are out right now, Paper Menagerie and Other Stories and Hidden Girl and Other Stories, as well as many others. He's written um, fascinating, fascinating concepts and very emotional short stories. Uh, he also has an epic fantasy series um, called Dandelion Dynasty, which blurs the lines of genre uh, a bit and uh, is also great work. We'll talk about that a little bit with him. Um, but before we go to Ken, uh, Brent has something to say as well. Yeah, yeah. Quick, quick ask for everybody. You've been spending a lot more time on YouTube this week because we've been releasing a lot of our like small interviews, the smaller like content creators and, and bloggers from the Hugo Awards just on YouTube. And in doing that, uh, I noticed that they were serving me ads on our videos, uh, and which made me a little confused because like we didn't turn ads on. I was like, what's happening? And it turns out basically YouTube, I'll say, takes advantage of small content creators and they don't even give you the option to like not show ads until you've grown to the size that they would pay you if you chose to keep the ads on, if that makes sense. So that's frustrating. Um, the way the rules work is you need a thousand subscribers to be able to actually like make that choice for yourself and either get paid or turn the ads off. Uh, because if you're it's ridiculous that we would not get paid any of those ads in any case. So if you don't yet subscribe on YouTube, please do. We have a few more uh, special episodes coming out just on YouTube this week uh, that are interviews from the, the Hugo Awards too. So um, that's uh, that's the ask. And also just a good to know for other small YouTube channels. I'm certainly happy to to know how much it uh, it matters to be able to just give people the choice. So that's it. Let's talk with Ken. Welcome, Ken. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Cody. Hi, Bren. Thanks for having me. Yeah, excited to have you. Thank you so much. Yeah, very excited to have you. Um, Brent, want to just get us right into it? Let's start it rolling. Yeah, absolutely. During the pandemic, you did something interesting that we'd love to, to ask you about, because in addition to, to writing, you also do, do some programming, and we'll talk more about You've had an interesting, an interesting life. But one really interesting thing there is during the pandemic, you put together a neural network trained on all your writing to try to then spit out, you know, new writing. Can you tell us a little bit about RoboCan? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, uh, so during the pandemic, um, I was actually suffering a bit of a crisis of faith. Um, I've always been someone who loved telling stories and believing the power of good storytelling to, um, you know, as an essential part of what makes us human and good humans at that. Um, but during the pandemic, I got to see how um, storytelling can be a, also a terrible thing. Um, you know, conspiracy theories, uh, all, all these ideas about blaming. Um, it, it, it seemed like these were also storytelling exercises, collective storytelling exercises that were achieving the exact opposite of the kind of effect I aimed for. Instead of bringing people together and, and giving them hope, um, it was tearing them apart um, and uh, destroying our democracy. Um, and so I sort of lost faith a little bit in storytelling, uh, and I couldn't write any stories at all. Um, but I had also committed to contributing a new story um, to uh, this magazine, Uncanny, and I didn't know what to do. Uh, the deadline was approaching, and I, I had no story. So in my despair, I decided to try something, which is to see if I could train a neural network on my fiction and see if RoboKen can actually write a story of hope when I could not. Um, it seems such a ridiculous idea now, but at the time I was at least 50% earnest about it. Um, and, uh, you know, because I was trained as a lawyer as well, I was very conscious about the potential issues involved in copyright when you use these neural networks that are trained on the Internet, quote unquote. Um, I mean, people are now much more aware of the issue as a result of things like stable diffusion, you know, the AI art generating um, uh, AI, because there's a lot of concern about 
copyright and, and whether the artists who were whose images were used to train the network ought to be trained, uh, ought to be compensated. Um, but, you know, very few people are asking similar questions about um, neural networks trained on, again, quote unquote, the Internet generating new text. You know, the copyright of that is actually not that easy to resolve. So to sidestep all of that and also to just make sure that I feel comfortable about what I was doing, I trained my network only on my own text. Uh, it, it was not trained on anything outside of my own body of work. So people who know machine learning know that that definitely yeah, is too small. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's not going to work because it's a very small body uh, a corpus. So the result is, um, you know, my RoboCon was never... Um, you know, it's no, it's no GPT three. It's no, <laughs> it's not going to be intelligent. No one's going to think Robo kind of sentient. Let's put it that way. Um, <laughs> but it was able to generate some very interesting uh, bits and pieces. Uh, they were seeds, if you will. Um, that they, it was interesting because Robo can somewhat sounded like me, and yet it would say things that I never thought of. And and there were bits and pieces of what it generated that just sounded so interesting. So. I kept on going and generating a whole bunch of it. And then afterwards, I was like, you know what? Um, there's something really interesting about the idea of having an AI generating wisdom for other AI. So maybe that's that's the story I, I want to write. So I ended up writing um, a story called 50 Things Every AI Working with Humans Ought to Know. And uh, it consists of basically an obituary for uh, an early AI who generated a bunch of wisdom for uh, for later AI, as well as a list of 50 things that this AI supposedly said. Um, now, most of the text in there is actually written by me as a human, but almost everything in there was prompted by something that RoboCan generated. And then I actually tried to include as many snippets from RoboCan as possible in the final story. So if you go through the whole list, there are um, quite a few items that were generated by RoboCan, uh, some of them edited by me, but some of them just verbatim. Um, and I, I found that to be really fun to, to, to write the story in which I try to put as much RoboCan into it as possible, and yet the story itself is also about this weird um, dynamic between an AI creator and her AI, where she was pretending to be the machine and the machine was pretending to be her, and they, they had this really weird uh, relationship. Um, and so, you know, ended up being a story that I really enjoyed writing, and it in some ways restored my faith um, in storytelling as an, as an exercise that is essential to our nature as humans. Um, so RoboCan served, you know, its function. Was it? The, I love there's that. One it's the line. most interesting way to overcome writer's block I think I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> there's one great line I remember. What was it about uh, rational numbers or something? One of the ones you left yes. in that RoboCan yes. gen generated? That, that was a RoboCan one, yes. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, I don't remember the exact um, quote, but it was so striking. I was like, I have to include this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I feel like a lot of your, you know, interviews and some of your reviews of your work and stuff um, describe describe your work as like about people kind of quote between cultures or quote liminal uh, to multiple cultural spaces like um, Japanese, Chinese, American, um, etc. Uh, and I think some readers might assume that it's related to your personal experience of emigrating from China to the U S. Um, but is this a good framework to understand your stuff through? That's a terrific question. Um, so, uh, so my response is, um, you know, going to be in two pieces. There's the, there's the simple one, which is, uh, usually when people ask that, or when, when people say that, what they really mean is, Ken is writing autobiography. Um, so they think, you know, the paper menagerie maybe is based on Ken's own experience. It's actually an incident from his life or something like that. Um, so I can just sort of say very explicitly, I don't write autobiography. Um, I've, um, I've actually made a very conscious choice to never explicitly put any of my own personal experiences directly into fiction. Um, there's nothing wrong with that practice if writers want to do it. Um, I just don't find that interesting for me personally as an aesthetic choice. So nothing I ever write is personal in that sense. I just don't ever bother putting my own real life into my fiction. Having said all of that, um, I also wanna say that um, it's, 
absolutely impossible to think that writers are not shaped by their own experience. I mean, how can you not be? I mean, the way you view the world, the way you think about it, the way you um, uh, just understand it is absolutely based on your personal experience. So, of course, everything you write as a fiction writer will be colored by those experiences. But I do want to be a little bit cautious here, which is I think a lot of times when readers or reviewers say that, um, there's a tendency to um, reduce um, authors to their demographic categories. So um, if an author is X, then everything they write must be solely be about speaking to people of X, and it's based on X experiences, and it's not... It's not universal, quote unquote, anymore. It's it's particular. It's unrelatable outside of that context. Um, I do think that's actually a very bad way to understand my work. Um, so to give you a very concrete experience uh, example, um, there's no doubt that because I literally moved between two uh, very different uh, national cultures. Um, you know, I emigrated. I left China as a child and then um, grew up and came of age in the U.S. Uh, there's no doubt that kind of experience makes me hyper attuned to cultural transitions and to uh, folks who travel from one culture to another and who are essentially uh, the term for us is, you know, third culture uh, children. We, 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 we end up feeling that we understand both cultures from an insider-outsider perspective, and then we sort of have to come to terms with what does that mean. Um, but that by no means is somehow particular and unique to us. Um, what I want to point out is actually all of us in modernity are third culture children. All of us, that's the essential modern experience. You grow up in a culture of your origin, and so much of our late capitalist society in modernity is about striving to go somewhere else. How many of us have moved across the country for college? How many of us have gone to places that we never would have gone to as children? We ended up learning to speak and acquire codes that we switch into. Um, we have to learn the world of finance or law or programming. These are just not, these are all separate cultures. We're always traveling between cultures. I mean, the way you speak to your childhood friend when you're visiting your hometown is completely different from the way you engage with folks you met only over Twitter. Um, the way you present yourself on Instagram is nothing like how you want to show yourself on LinkedIn. And all of us have these experiences of traveling between different places and, 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 and sort of feeling like we're living multiple lives. This idea of transitioning of, of constantly switching between different spheres and having multiple uh, identities is you know the quintessential modern experience um, and a lot of my stories are about that unsettledness of, of modernity um, and also just a little bit on, on that final uh, point um, I, I see the word liminal used a lot for uh, my work and I do want to push back against that a little bit because I think oftentimes when people use liminal what they mean is they're on the edges they're sort of not at the center they're they're sort of in between they don't belong anywhere that's not my personal experience my personal experience is that um, I very much feel like I'm at the center of modernity and at the center of a new kind of experience um, in the same way that, you know, uh, our country is going through this grand transition right now where essentially we're fighting over what is the American story and what is it supposed to be and who gets to tell it. Um, so are you an American when you are a native born person or are you? Can you be American as an immigrant? Um, do you have to speak English as your first language to be American, or is that not required? Is English the only American language? And is the Anglo-Saxon experience the only true American experience? Or can we reimagine this and say that all of us are at the center of this new American experience? All of us are at the center of constructing a new American identity. All of us are at the forefront of this grand experiment of redefining what it means to be American. And, you know, to the extent that you believe in the great American myth of American exceptionalism, maybe where we go, so will the world. Um, in some ways, maybe the way we're engaging with modernity, with multiculturalism, with diversity, with coming to terms with 
the past with immigration, with climate change, maybe all of this is in some ways an interesting example and an interesting experiment for the rest of the world to observe um, and to construct their own new identities. So um, that's what I hope people will get out of it when they understand my personal story, that it's in the particularities of my story that I strive to tell universal stories. And if they can, try not to limit what I write into X, Y, Z. Um, it's not just Asian American lit or whatever you want to call it. Um, it's, it's meant for everyone. It's meant to speak to the universal human experience. It's in that particularity that we truly see the universality of the human experience. Yeah, I think everybody has felt like both an insider and an outsider at some at some point in their their lives, of course. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, absolutely. I think it does. And it does speak to the universality, I believe. Your work is very good at doing that. Um, Thank you. you. Your professional history, Ken, is so rich. Um, and yeah. it, like, why did you when and why did you decide to become a, like a full time writer? Do you even believe in that as a distinction I mean, you don't believe in a lot of i feel like dualities <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I i really wonder um so uh just to recap a little bit about my personal professional experience um i was an english major but i actually worked as a software engineer um as my first career uh, out of college um later i went back to law school clerk for a federal judge and then practice as a corporate lawyer for um, a number of years. Um, and then I swapped from that into uh, litigation consulting. I was essentially an expert witness in patent, trade secret, copyright cases. Uh, and that was my third career um, before finally going full time as a writer, um, maybe four or five years ago. I can't remember exactly when. Um, but um, I would say that, you know, all of these professions seem very disparate and, and, and very different from each other, but they actually are very, they are unified by one theme, which is this idea of constructing, um, they're, they're essentially all engineering jobs because they're about constructing artifacts out of symbols. Um, you can say that that's actually, again, essentially what our symbol-based economy has come to. All of us, most of us really have jobs which involve constructing artifacts out of symbols, whether it's, you know, writing a contract or drafting a program or writing a story, you're trying to create an artifact out of symbols. You're trying to engineer something, a virtual machine that achieves a particular purpose, whether it's to fulfill the goals of your client, to carry out a particular result in the computer, or to give the reader a particular emotional experience. I mean, they're all machines designed to do that. Um, and so in another way of looking at all three of them is that they're all storytelling exercises, except they follow different rules. The, the, the storytelling exercise we're most familiar with is in fiction, but what is, you know, what is a program? What is, what is a contract? These are also stories. They represent ways of thinking. They represent um, a particular vision for how the world ought to be and, and an attempt to make it happen that way. Um, and I ended up uh, learning a lot about storytelling from doing all of these different types of um, symbolic engineering, I guess I would say. And so one of the things that I talk about the most, uh, um, my, I have a side gig as a futurist uh, traveling around to corporations and universities and governments and talk to them about how to think about the future and, and how, you know, science fiction can teach what science fiction has to teach them in terms of getting ready for the future. And one of the messages that I emphasize over and over again is that um, stories are incredibly important. Um, we, the way we understand the world, the way we come to terms with our most important values are entirely story based, right? So just, you know, on a personal level, think about some value that matters a lot to you, whether it's patriotism or faith or freedom or equality. Um, when you think very hard and very deep about these words, it turns out that the reason they give you some sort of emotional anchor, some sort of visceral reaction, is not based on some philosophical abstraction or some argument about 
logic and pros and cons. It's because there's a story of some sort deep in your memory, usually from childhood, that anchors you. You know, for me, um, courage is always going to be defined by the way a friend stood up for me on the playground. Uh, when I was very little, um, no matter what else courage means, that fundamentally is going to be the story that defines it for me. Uh, that's going to be the emotional anchor. Um, when I think about, um, you know, patriotism, uh, it's uh, it's always going to be about Nathan Hale. Um, again, because of a little story that I read in a textbook when I was little. Um, when I think about uh, love, you know, I think about my grandmother sitting next to me, um, knitting a sweater, and she had arthritis, and so. Her fingers were having a lot of problems manipulating the needles. And I, I asked her, you know, why, why, why do you do this? Does it hurt? And she says, yeah, it does hurt. But, you know, I, I want to keep going because I don't want you to be cold. And that, to me, has always yeah. been the defining story of, of what it means to love. Um, but all of us are like that. You know, the, the way we, we have our dearest held values are because of these early memories of love, of pain, of trauma, of, of, of joy. Um, this is, you know, I'm, I'm hardly the first one to think about this. Dickens was famous for having this entire theory about childhood and memories defining who you are, who, your, your deepest personalities. He wrote at the time before psychoanalysis. So he was using a language that we would not necessarily um, uh, use anymore. But I think he was deeply insightful, this, this idea that stories are core to who we are and core to our values. So on a larger scale, you know, modern nation states cannot ask people to die anymore for, you know, for king and glory and, and whatnot. Modern nation states ask people to die for a story, for an ideal. They, 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 the, the reason why we are asked to die all the time uh, by, 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 by nation states is because there's a story, a collective story that we believe in, that we think is worth it. Um, it's, it's not pros and cons. It's not some economic analysis. Ultimately, when you ask people to make these great sacrifices, they have to believe in the story. That's, that's all there is to it. Um, so a very long roundabout way to get back to your original point, which is um, I, I feel like I've been doing storytelling one way or another all my life, and it's studying what storytelling means has been my life's work. Uh, and I don't know if I necessarily have to be a full-time writer to do it, but it certainly doesn't hurt um, to, 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 to do it this way uh, and, and to get to um, think about it all the time. <laughs> yeah, it must be, must be fun, at least. Um, so you've always been a full-time storyteller, at least. Yeah, that's a good way to think about it. <laughs> So on that note of uh, sort of science fiction being a, a, a way to sort of tell stories about things that don't exist yet and sort of help us to get ready for things, um, something you write about in a lot of your stories is the singularity, which is that the idea that um, – uh, you can upload your mind into a computer, basically, and, and lots of other people do, and that's that's the singularity. Um, and frequently, the characters in your stories face a choice. Um, are they going to do it or not? Um, and so I would love to ask you, if that existed, would you do it? Um, <laughs> a very difficult question to answer, actually. Um, I, I think it depends on what it really means to be uploaded. Um, I, I think... Um, let, let me put it this way, right? The idea of a singularity is really sort of the sci-fi version of the afterlife. I mean, there's a bit of a sense of, of choice to it, but fundamentally, that's what it is. Um, and you're, you're asking the, the, the question of whether you would do it or not it amounts to whether you want to step into the afterlife or not. Um, and I, I don't know if there's a, there's a rational way to answer that. Um, I, I would have to say that I don't, I don't know my answer in the abstract. I have to come to that moment and see why I'm being asked to do so and what is happening. Is this a choice that's irrevocable? Is this a choice I'm being made under duress? Is this, what does it mean to be uploaded? Well, I have my senses. Well, I have continuity of consciousness. Um, I would want to know all of that before I can make a decision. And I think ultimately it's going to be decided based on how I feel at that moment. It's going to be a gut feeling. Um, I don't think I can make an abstract choice up front. Um, I'm very, I'm a big believer that our choices are not dictated by abstractions, but by very concrete experiences. And 
all the experiences I will have between now and that moment, that hypothetical moment, will determine my answer. And there's no way for me to know until I get there. It's sort of like Susan Sontag's point about photographs. Um, I think she at one point said that all photographs are lies. And not in the trivial sense of all photographs are staged or, you know, edited or whatnot. Her point is much deeper. Her point is that when you observe a photograph, you think you have seen all there is to be seen and you think you can interpret it, but you have seen nothing because to make sense of that moment, you must understand every moment that led up to that moment. Until you have that entire context, you cannot possibly interpret that one photograph in any way that is meaningful. Uh, and I feel the same way about choices like that. To be able to make a choice like that, I must live every moment up to that moment. Um, so it sounds like a cop-out, but I really do believe that um, I can't answer that in the abstract until I get there. <laughs> Maybe you've answered it a little bit in your in your stories. <laughs> through <laughs> the, being, being able to explore the idea through the fictional characters. Um, mm. You know, another element of your stories, and uh, I'll use this opportunity to say, uh, when I first read Paper Menagerie and Hidden Girl uh, years ago, it was before we started the podcast, and it's the one instance I can think of that I uh, thought man, I really wish I could tell this author how much these stories meant to me and how my experience was. And uh, I get to do that now. So thank you so much for thank you. Me meaning. Yeah, it's very meaningful reading these. Um, and I'm excited that I get to tell you in person. <laughs> um, thank you. You're, and and part of that that emotion, I think you do really well is that your stories uh, are often, the characters and the emotional core of the stories are often about familial connections. Um, and I'm just wondering if you, it really gets me. Um, and I'm wondering if, if that's something, is family something you are interested in as a, a topic to explore and it just kind of blends um, in with the genre fiction? Because it's more of a, uh, I feel like it's more rare in genre fiction to have that mm. be the emotional core. Uh, uh, again, um, the, <laughs> these are very good questions because you're forcing me to think very deeply about why I do what I do. And, and these are often things that I, choices that I make without necessarily being consciously aware of why. Um, in this particular case, I think I do actually have an answer that I've thought about um, because I have explored that question for myself. Um, I mean, you know, you're right that a lot of the emotional centerpiece of my stories are about families, whether it's found families or NATO families or, or families you construct or families you, um, you accept and, and whatnot. Um, they are very much about that. I, I guess I will say this. Uh, I began to write and focus on family relationships uh, primarily because of two things. One is the fact that, you know, my wife and I started a family. Um, having kids definitely changed me as a writer. I, I My topics changed. The, the sort of things that I wanted to explore changed. Just having children made me think a lot about my own place in the chain of generations in continuity. Um and the other reason that I started to explore this direction was a conscious pushback against some of the atomistic individualism that I feel late capitalism has been pushing on us. So, so I'll, I'll expand on that a little bit. Um, you know, in our society, um, you know, if you if you listen to uh, policy planners and economists, um, you know, individuals should be as atomistic as possible because that allows them to be the most efficient um, agents, rational agents. If you're not tied down to a community, to a family, and if your concerns are solely about maximizing your talents and productivity, then having no roots and no attachments at all is the best because you can allocate anywhere in the world. You can be deployed in the most efficient manner and really maximize your, your talents and output and, and boost the economy and, and the, the output for everyone. Um, so in that sense, there's a tendency to encourage the uh, atomic version of individuals and families and, and, and nuclear families. Uh, there's a reason it's called that and to push away from extended families, uh, uh, deep networks, um, and the idea that you should be rooted to a place. Um, but the more 
I think about sustainability and sustainable development and what makes people really happy, the more I realize that that vision is deeply flawed. We are happiest not in an abstract maximization of our individual potentials, but in the connections we establish with people. We are happiest because we are human, we're embodied creatures, in the sense of being embedded, rooted, and feeling the sense of continuity of a larger purpose than this very brief mortal span that we are allocated. Um, you know, when I think about the fact that I am here, as you know, as President Obama put it, we are the dreams of our ancestors made real. And that is absolutely true. I am here because for hundreds of generations, my ancestors survived. They, they were enslaved, they were beaten, they were raped, they were tortured, um, and perhaps they were also the torturers and rapists and, 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 and so on and so forth. But they all survived. They tried to do the best they could in a world that was very, very difficult, and they made difficult moral decisions, and they, they, their suffering <laughs> is the foundation for how I'm here. And I have a duty now to not pass on the generational trauma, but to pass on the generational hope to those who come after me as much as I can. I am one link in this unbroken chain that goes all the way back to the earliest humans to whatever post-humans will be a hundred generations from now. Um, and that's such a sacred, beautiful duty to be placed on me, far more than any atomistic uh, individual desire I might have to feel embedded in that chain, in that to have my place in this web of humanity across time and place. It's very moving to me. And so I've always consciously tried to push back against an atomistic conception of individuals and try to explore the way we're defined by all the relationships we have. I also think that, you know, one of the consequences of this um, world that we live in is, you know, uh, to, to, to further the goals of, of efficiency and economy and whatnot, we tend to de-emphasize every relationship other than romance. There's a tendency that in, in our modern lit, we emphasize only romance as the defining relationship and everything else is unimportant. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's a feature of modernism. It's a feature of, of, of literature from that time. Um, but I, I just don't agree with that. I don't think we define our lives by one grand romance. It's, it's just not true. The, the lived experience is that we have many, many relationships with mentors, teachers, lovers, with children, with parents, with friends, with foes, uh, with everybody. You know, I, I am defined not by one thing, but by the hundreds of relationships I've built up um, uh, over my lifetime. And it's so important to honor that embeddedness of, of every human being. So family, to me, is the most obvious way to sort of connect to that, emphasize that, because family is interesting because a lot of it we don't get to choose. We, we have sort of figure out what is our relationship to this stuff that's just handed to us that we didn't get to choose. And yet we do get to choose some of it. We, we get to choose some of it and not all of it. And that sort of um, semi-choice to me is, is very interesting because we can't just construct everything from scratch and yet we don't have to accept everything just the way they're handed to us. That to me is a nice metaphor for much of you know culture and much of what it means to be a human telling a story from generation to generation. Um, I feel like family is a, is a really neat uh, metaphor as well as a concrete stage on which all of these complicated human emotions play out. So anyway, that's kind of why I do it. It's it's interesting. It's 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 thematically resonant for me, uh, and I I just feel like by emphasizing it, I, I push back very hard against the idea that individuals are meant to be atoms because we're not. So so yes, you are interested in thinking about family. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> um, you know, you write like an incredibly wide breadth about a, uh, of subjects. You write about a, an incredibly wide breadth of subjects um, and settings and characters. Uh, do you feel like the writing shorts um, gives you the ability to kind of go wherever you please and that writing novels limits you? Or do you think that, uh, you know, is there is there a place for one? and a place for other uh, for the other when you're thinking about um, what you want to write about? 
I have to say, I can't really say that I know a lot about writing standalone novels. I've never done one. I've only written very short things and very long things. I mean, um, most of my stories are about 5,000 words or under, and I've written this one super long thing of four books over 4,000 pages uh, called The Dunland Dynasty, which was conceived of really as just one thing. So I don't know if I have any experience. I'm curious what it's like to write a standalone novel, because I'm sure that would be very interesting. I've never done one. Um, but the very short things and the very long things are, to me, very different. Um, the, the very long thing, you know, Dara is a world I created, and it's a world of engineering. Um, that's, that's the primary pitch. The pitch is that it's an, it's an epic fantasy novel, except it's, there are no wizards in it. It's just engineers, engineers trying to build things. Um, that's the magic. Um, for Dara, I had to sort of live in it for over a decade. I mean, when I started writing it, my oldest daughter was um, uh, just a newborn, and now she's 12 years old, and the last book just came out a couple months ago. So it's taken me more than a decade to really tell that story, and I had to live in it. I mean, there are moments when I felt like I knew the world of Dara better than I knew the real world, like I could understand its system and rules better than I understood the systems and rules in our world. Um, and that's a really wonderful experience. I mean, you are, you feel like you really moved to another land and you are really getting to live like one of the natives and you're really experiencing this whole other world and learning an alternative way the world could be. Um, you really feel its problems. I mean, you know how it is when you move to a new city, uh, the way you feel about it after six months is very different from how you feel about it after 10 years there. You know, you get to see all sorts of problems you didn't realize were there, and you get to see all sorts of wonderful things you didn't know earlier either. So novels, long, epic fantasy novels do that. They, you, you, you really... Um, I'm hoping that this comes across for readers too. Um, you know, as a, as a writer, I really feel like I got to live another life. And I hope that readers do too, that after they go through it, they feel like they got to live another life. And that's, that's the ideal experience. Shorts, on the other hand, are very different. I mean, you are a tourist um, in these worlds. You, you, you go in and you go out. Um, shorts are just not long enough. The, the experience that you're trying to convey to the reader um, is very different. You're, you're not trying to make them immersed in the world and have them really feel every nuance about the world. You're trying to give them a very concentrated dose, an experience that will allow them to take it and go back to their own world and examine reality um, in a different way. There's a, there's a very, uh, uh, I would say that my core cur core aesthetic for short fiction is actually very simple. I tend to write what are called stories about literalized metaphors. Um, so I would take some aspect of reality that we speak about in a metaphorical sense, um, and I make it literally true in this alternative world. And I give you a concentrated dose of what that's like so that you can now come back and re-examine the metaphor and, and hopefully see something new in it. Um, so an example of this would be something like The Paper Menagerie. Um, it's, it's a magic realist story and in which origami animals are alive. Um, so that's meant to be a literalization of the idea that love makes everything feel more alive, right? We, we have this idea that when, you're, when you feel loved, when you're, when you're loving somebody, the world seems to come alive for you. Things are more vivid. Everything feels more uh, uh, immediate. Everything feels more real, more grounded. Um, so in this fantasy world, um, the paper animals actually, origami animals actually come to life because of love. Um, and, and now, and, 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 and whether they keep on moving um, is about whether the love that sustains them is still there or not. Um, so that becomes... That becomes a story um, when you when you have a way of tangibly interacting with something like this that's metaphorically true. You get to see new things you don't otherwise see because, you know, I think our minds are very uh, visual and very tactile. Uh, there's a reason why having something tangible to manipulate uh, beyond a metaphor is important to us. Right. <laughs> when you literalize a metaphor like that, it's often uh, the sort of thing that you cannot sustain over 
the length of an entire novel. At least I can't. Um, I think they're beautiful um, when the metaphor is left somewhat un filled in so that there's enough room for the reader to use imagination to make up for all the flaws that are there. Um, but when, when you do it that way, it, it's, you, you, you leave, you, you sketch in just enough for the reader to do the world conjuring for you. Um, you leave in a few islands and then allow the reader to fill in all the clouds and all the wonderful um, ocean currents in between. Um, and, and it ends up feeling like a very expensive, beautiful world. But if you had to go in there and meticulously paint every little bit of it, very soon the flaws would come out. Um, so I enjoy short fiction precisely because it's good for constructing these thought experiment. It's good for making these metaphors literally true for, for the nonce. And and readers can experience it and then hopefully emerge with a new view of their own lives. Um, that's the hope. Uh, but it's a very different thing when I'm writing an, the epic fantasy novel. That is all about immersion, all about trying to do as much as I can to portray this alternative reality that I got to experience and see if readers can have the same experience that I did. It's it's fascinating. And it uh, it also, you know, talking about Dandelion Dynasty, um, which is a wonderful series, um, the its build is kind of epic fantasy, like you, you say, but it's got a lot of science fiction elements to it, right? I mean, that, that, that genre blend is always kind of questionable. Uh, like where, where's the line, um, to call yeah. one thing, one thing and something else in speculative fiction. But, uh, you did a lot of like real tactile, um, uh, making and imagining and vetting of technologies for uh, Dandelion Dynasty, didn't you? Can you yeah, tell us a little I, bit about that? I, I had a lot of fun uh, working on that series. It really was uh, awesome. Um, so just to your point about, you know, fantasy versus sci-fi, um, I don't know if there's a hard line between the two because, you know, a lot of sci-fi classics are really fantasy. I mean, you know, I personally think... Do androids dream of electric sheep, uh, which is often described as sci-fi, is really ultimately a fantasy novel. It's about um, it's about this core metaphorical experience we have in modernity of alienation. It's about the sense that <laughs> we are the only real people, and and a lot of the people we interact with are not fully human. It's it's a very modern experience, and and it's not so much sci-fi as it is a fantasy exploration. And similarly. Something like 2001, A Space Odyssey, um, has a lot of uh, elements at the end that I feel are really much more about spirituality, about the province of fantasy, about unknowability. Um, but all that aside, um, I do think that, you know, traditionally people have said the real divide between fantasy and sci-fi is... Um, whether the universe is knowable or not. If the universe is knowable in the book, then it's sci-fi. And if that is not a fundamental mm -hmm. assumption, then it is fantasy. Um, so I will say that in the Dandelion Dynasty, um, one of the most important characters says outright that his motto is, the universe is knowable. So if, if that is the case, then... <laughs> Uh, obviously, the Dungeon Dynasty really ought to be more uh, more in the realm of sci-fi. But to be honest, I, 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 I think what really intrigued me about the Dungeon Dynasty, what drove me to write it in the first place, was um, this whole experience I have and had and have about um, technology, about, about modernity, about the sense of is the modernity we're living in, the only way to be modern. Okay, so to back up a little bit. Um, for a while, I was traveling around the world, attending literary festivals. Um, and, uh, was, you know, this was shortly after the Paper Menagerie won a bunch of awards. So I was invited to a lot of um, uh, festivals around the world. And I got to meet readers from around the world. And it was just a great experience to talk to them about what you might work struck them and, and what resonated. And one thing that kept on coming up over and over again is this idea about language, about our different emotional connections to different languages. So um, in a lot of uh, places that I went to, which were former colonies, um, the writers would tell me that they feel this, to them, modernity feels very translated. 
Okay, so what they mean is, you know, they grow up speaking the mother tongue in the indigenous language. But in order to acquire modernity, to talk about economics and science and computer science and uh, all the rest of it, they have to learn a colonial language. They have to learn English. They have to learn German. They have to learn French. They have to learn Spanish. These are these are the languages in which modernity is conveyed to them. And then they cannot speak about these things in their indigenous language. And so to them, modernity feels very translated. And I was wondering about that. And I said, oh, I, I, I understand that feeling. And I'm trying to think about whether, um, whether that's something that we experience ourselves as English speakers. And I realized that we actually do the same thing. It's just that we don't normally realize it. So again, words like chemistry and physics and economics, these are not native Anglo-Saxon words at all. They are constructed from classical roots, from Greek and Latin. It is very interesting to me that the, the birth of modernity in the Renaissance is also associated with a total um, reconstruction of our classical heritage. So if I can be so bold, modernity is an example of Greco-Roman punk. It's we take these <laughs> Greco-Roman roots and we reappropriate them to do things that they were never meant to do. Um, you know, if you went to Aristotle and Plato and Socrates and talked to them about physics and chemistry and whatnot, they would have no idea what you're talking about, even though the roots are Greek. We took those roots and put them together into these new machines, entirely new things. We invented modernity by translating um, from a classical language. Yeah. So I said, okay, what if I could somehow um, defamiliarize modernity and give uh, modern American readers that experience? And one of the things I thought about doing is, what if I could take um, instead of Greco-Roman punk for modernity, what if I could do soak punk? I take classical East Asian roots in philosophy, in technology, in um, political uh, organization, and I imagine an alternative renaissance and an alternative way of reappropriating all of that stuff to construct um, modernity out of it. What if modernity could be an alternative vision of modernity could be created, rooted in those East Asian elements. So the focus here is not on East Asian history or whatnot. It's, it's about taking those elements, much as we took Greek and Latin roots, and constructing a mo modern world with it, with its own problems. So the problems of meritocracy, the problems of democratic governance, the problems of how do you construct one people out of a diverse set of origins? How do you deal with original sin in the founding of a nation? How do you deal with um, trying to create a chorus of voices to tell the story of a nation as opposed to just one voice? How do you account for all these problems that we think of as quintessentially modern using a set of roots that are not Greco-Roman? Um, so that's what really the Dungeon Dynasty was about. I wrote the first book to sort of give everybody this level playing field of, of the political and cultural and historical roots I was going to use. So it's a fantasy reimagining of the founding of the Han Dynasty. Um, at the same time, I put into it a lot of technology bits, right? Silk and bamboo and feathers and wood and animal sinew, all of these, the technology vocabulary of classical East Asian engineering and the grammar of classical East Asian engineering, the the the, the biomimetics, the, the way that everything is supposed to be harmonized between the human and the natural. And I took all of that and I took all the philosophical stuff. And then in the rest of the series, I, I'm, I'm trying to see, can you take these roots and construct an alternative modernity that accounts for all the problems that we face as modern Americans? Um, it's very much, you know, sort of this alternative re-envisioning of the story of America using these East Asian roots. Um, I, as far as I know, no one had ever tried to do something like this. And it's, it's very interesting to me as an exercise. So that's what I was trying to do, you know, a silk punk epic fantasy. But fundamentally, it's about engineering. It's about how do you construct modern um, governance, modern identities, modern sense of technology, out of these very different roots. And if, if you can live in a world like this, now by comparing that world with the world we actually live in, now we can figure out which aspects of modernity are universal, which aspects are 
perhaps particular to our history, and which aspects we can change and rewrite, um, and we don't have to be trapped by our own history. So anyway, that's the that's the grand sort of philosophical underpinning of it. But honestly, another way of describing this is I just wanted to have a lot of fun imagining uh, airship battles and, 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 and how can you invent computers out of looms and, and, and how do you do object-oriented programming if you have no actual, you know, CPUs. Um, anyway, that part is also really fun to me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's a really fun series. Uh, it's totally... Um... It covers all that, the, the mythology to modernity, which um, is, uh, yeah, which makes it tough to categorize um, in terms of yeah. genre fiction. Yeah. Um, so we have we have a little more time. I want to get this one in quick um, because we've talked with other authors about adapt, adapt, adapting their work to screen. Um, and you have, uh, there's a new series out called Pantheon on EMC plus, um, that's about, uh, loosely a lot of the stories in hidden girl, um, adaptations. Um, and, uh, I'm just curious, you're a consulting producer. I'm curious how involved you are and, and what that's like letting go of your work. So, um, AMC, uh, bought the rights to the stories and they wanted to develop into a TV series and Craig Silverstein was hired as the showrunner to make it happen. Um, so the show is basically all him. He's the one who is the vision behind it and made it, made it happen. But I did play a role in it. Um, uh, Craig was very, uh, clear from the very start that he wanted me to be involved and wanted to make sure that I would feel good about the result. So I was brought into the writer's room and from the beginning, and I worked with all the writers to sketch out the arc for the first season um, and to work through all the issues. I mean, you know, I, I, it's really very fun for me to watch the show because not only do I see my story directly translated to the screen, but I also see bits and pieces that I talked about in the writer's room, make it onto the screen. You know, they asked me about how would you make this sort of hack happen? And I said, okay, well, you know, uh, based on my experience as a technologist and from having seen a lot of this sort of thing being done in real life, this is what I think the best way to do it would be. Um, and then, you know, I watched the show and I see them doing exactly what I said uh, they could do. And it's really fun to see that, to see your ideas being actually put into the into the show. Um, you know, we, we had discussions about the new characters and, and what what is their motivation. We had discussions about the limits of the upload process and, and what sort of plausible flaws might be there. And, and we worked, we talked about the emotions. I mean, it was really fun to meet with all the writers and to work with them. And even after that very intensive initial couple of weeks, uh, later on, I also got consulted uh, just over, over Zoom and, um, uh, and, and by email. Um, I got to see, you know, scripts, uh, early sketches, all sorts of stuff. So, you know, I wouldn't say that, you know, I was so involved as to be able to claim to have um, been one of the writers, but I was very involved. And, and I really enjoyed the experience. It was really fun to be there and to have a hand in shaping the final show. And I, I, I love it. I think the, the final show is very cool. Um, and uh, Craig and the writers did an amazing job, as did the animators, as did the voice actors. Um, everybody who participated in that show just uh, really, I think, connected with the material. And they got what I was trying to do. Um, and I can say that the final vision really is something I'm actually proud of and pleased to be associated with. It's not something I want to say, oh, I just sold the I just sold the rights. Don't come and talk to me. Uh, <laughs> this is a show that I'm actually very proud to to be associated with. Uh, it's very cool. That's fun. And, and uh, it seems like kind of a rare experience for prose writers when their work's being adapted. Um, You're right. And- I, a lot of yeah, a lot of my friends who, who have had this sort of experience didn't really necessarily enjoy it. So I feel very lucky. Um, I, I did enjoy this experience a lot. That's awesome. And the, the show is also awesome. Uh, and coming out one episode at a time, um, much to my bingey chagrin. Um, <laughs> the, but it's keeping me, it's keeping me every time it refreshes. I'm, w- I'm watching the next one. I've been enjoying it a lot. Um, okay. Uh, our last question for you is Ken, What's next? What can ourselves and our audience look out for from you? Okay, so right now I'm still recovering from um, 
having published uh, Speaking Bones, the last volume in the Dan Zhang dynasty, uh, I'm still sort of just enjoying hearing from readers who finally finished this massive series and, and who can tell me what they think and, um, and just sort of enjoying this glow. <laughs> That's the best thing I can put it, of, <laughs> of enjoying sharing Dara with everyone. Um, so I don't have concrete plans right now for my next project, but I can say that I'm probably not going to do an epic fantasy any time soon. Uh, 12 years <laughs> onto one project is Got a that lot. Got your system. It's a lot. It's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I want to jump right in to do 12 years again. Um, I, I may uh, settle on some sort of project uh, that's actually a standalone novel. Um, I would love to find something that I, that I really enjoy doing that way. Um, but right now, in order to sort of creatively keep myself engaged i'm doing a lot of short fiction and there will be a bunch of new short stories coming out from me so those of you who follow my work Woo! will know that i have not been writing short fiction much for a few years uh, because of the dandelion dynasty but I'm, I'm writing a lot more now uh in short fiction there's one coming out um from the anthology the book of witches um edited by jonathan strong who i believe you just talked with recently we just we, yeah, we just yes. interviewed him yeah. um and uh that 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 story I'm, i really enjoyed writing that one for him uh i have a new story uh that's a collaboration with carolyn yukum uh for um uncanny again uh that i think is just a really great story carolyn and i uh uh this is our first collaboration, but we really clicked, and I'm super excited about it. Uh, and there are a couple of other short stories I'm um, scheduled to write that I'm working on. Uh, and it's just been a lot of fun to sort of get back into writing short fiction. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's, it's fun to go in there and sketch just sketch the idea of the world in and let the reader fill in all the rest of it. Um, and it, it's... Uh, I miss that you know it's fun to be able to do that sort of quick dip in and out and then to just make the make the point um to tell the story i want to tell and then be done with it um it's a lot of it's a lot of a lot of fun good well we are excited we're excited to read anything you put out and uh we were very excited to talk with you today um thank you so much for spending the time with us thank you very much for having me it's a real pleasure yeah wonderful to meet you thanks Great. Later.